Welcome to the History Valley Podcast um, with Rose Jacob Berman. Today, I'm joined by Professor James Tabor. Last time he joined us, we talked about his book, The Jesus Dynasty. And we talked about Jesus's um, father, Pantera, according to uh, the works of Celsus. And that, and that, was, and that is uh, contrary to um, the view that Jesus was actually the son of Joseph. I'll leave a link to that video in the description. But today, we're going to be talking about something quite different. We're going to be talking about the famous um, Waco siege or the Waco incident. Um, some people call it the Waco siege or the Waco incident, whatever. And today, um, uh, Professor Tabor joins us to talk about that. He also um, was involved in negotiations to try to get David Koresh, the central figure uh, behind the whole thing, to try to um, surrender peacefully. But unfortunately, the authorities had other plans. And even though the negotiations appeared to be going well, uh, they decided to storm um, the building anyway. And several people were killed, and it ended uh, tragically. Today, today I'm gonna uh, we're gonna be talking about the siege in great detail, the the what led up to it, and uh, the negotiations, and how it could have ended the, uh, differently. So that takes me to my first question: What caused you to get involved in the Waco situation? Yeah, and I, you know, looking for a name for it, I would actually go with uh, the Waco tragedy because we talk about right. tragedy as something that was not necessary, but it did happen. And because of the loss of life on both sides, you know, six BATF officers were also killed in the initial raid on February 28th. So this is 1993, soon be 30 years ago. I was a younger, much younger professor 30 years ago. I've been, I was at the University of North Carolina where I am now, but I'd only been there, let's see, uh, I think I came in 89, this was in 93. It's the kind of thing that you never plan for or expect to happen. My field is, as you know, because we've talked about it, is uh, early Christianity. And I do focus a lot on Christianity as an apocalyptic movement, an apocalyptic messianic movement in what we would call the late second temple period. So that would bring in the Dead Sea Scrolls about a hundred years before the time of Jesus. It would take you on through the first century CE or AD, which includes Jesus and John the Baptist and James and all of that. That's my specialty. And even though I've always had an interest in apocalypticism through the ages, because it's a perspective, as you know, that gets repeated endlessly, even in our own time, where it seems like every generation, whether you're talking about Christians, Jews, or Muslims, this would be in the West, uh, seems to come up with reasons that a portion of the population, at least, are convinced that uh, the end of the age is near, sometimes referred to as the end of the world. But really, in biblical terms, it's the end of the age. That's the way Jesus refers to it in his apocalyptic chapters in the uh, Synoptic Gospels. So I had an interest in that as a scholar, just what I would call the dynamics of messianic biblical apocalypticism. So by biblical, I mean an apocalyptic system that is based on prophetic text in the Bible and trying to interpret them in the light of current events, whatever generation it is. And as you know, we find this all through, we have it of course in the first century with Jesus and the Jesus movement, Apostle Paul, but it's in the second and third and fourth century. A lot of people think it just died out, but it didn't. This idea that the end might be near uh, just continues down through the Middle Ages. 
And it seems like every generation has enough tragedy in it and enough crises that people can become convinced once again that uh, we could be in the end times and maybe this, this, there are signs of the end. So I'm using apocalyptic in a very specific way to mean the signposts that indicate the time of the end is near that the last generation of history would witness and see uh, as based upon different biblical prophecies. So you get, that's my little introduction as to what caused me to get involved. That didn't cause me to get involved directly because I keep my nose pretty much in the New Testament and in the Dead Sea Scrolls and ancient texts from the Second Temple period, which would basically be couple hundred years before the time of Jesus down through Bar Kokhba, which would be about 135 CE. You know, it's roughly a, what, two, three hundred year period where apocalypticism is just at the height, not just the Jesus movement. Josephus, the Jewish historian, records at least a dozen messianic figures uh, that he mentions during this time as he goes back to the reign of Herod the Great and so forth. So the way I got involved was on the Sunday of the raid. It was February 28th, 1993 on Sunday. I was doing something upstairs in my study and my wife called me from downstairs. She had the CNN on, I think, television. And she says, James, James, you need to come down here. There's been this, uh, federal raid in Texas, and it's against uh, an apocalyptic group or a Bible-based group, and she said something like, you know, the kind of stuff that you study, and the guy is on television, and he's had some radio interviews, and they're playing them, and there's a siege, and people have been killed, and so forth, and he, uh, she basically called me down, and I had never heard of the group. So literally from that moment, uh, the raid was uh, Sunday morning, Texas time. It was all over the networks just instantly, you know how news flashes are. And uh, 10, 11, 12 o'clock, I was watching it intensely and following it. So uh, as I listened to some of the material coming out from David Koresh, who I quickly was able to figure out as the leader of the group, uh, and I found out the name of the group is the uh, Davidians. And they didn't start with David Course. They started back in the 1930s. They're a break off from the Seventh-day Adventists. But, of course, I knew about the Seventh-day Adventists. That's one of the apocalyptic groups of the 19th century that I study. You know, when I do move from the first century to our own time, especially in the United States, you've got Mormons, you've got Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got the Seventh-day Adventists that are all very apocalyptic groups from the 19th century, 1800s. So we're, we're a pretty apocalyptic country when, when it comes to the history of uh, Christian apocalypticism. And uh, so I, I had not heard of this group, but I was able pretty quickly within a day or two to figure out a few things that it was a break off from the Seven Day Adventists that told me a little bit. I was able, we didn't have the internet the way we do now. Like I could have just gone on something like Wikipedia, and, you know, looked up the videos, you couldn't do that. But I did have, I have a colleague in uh, Houston, Texas. His name is Philip Arnold, Dr. Philip Arnold, PhD from uh, Rice University. And guess what he works on? Exactly what I work on. And those, his field is early Christianity, ancient apocalyptic ideas, Dead Sea Scrolls, New Testament, Jesus, Paul, John the Baptist, James, the whole thing. So we have very similar interests. And uh, I called him because he was in Texas. And I, I was actually born in Texas. I never lived there very much, but my father... Uh, uh, joined the military right after Pearl Harbor. And like thousands and thousands of other GIs, he got sent to San Antonio, Texas to uh, Lackland Air Force Base. And he joined the Army Air Corps 
back in the 40s, right after Pearl Harbor. I wasn't born then, of course, but that kind of put me into Texas because I was later born in Texas uh, a few years after that. So uh, I know something about Texas culture. Of course, I knew where Waco was. This is actually outside of Waco on a plot of land, a kind of ranch that they call the Mount Carmel Center. The group called it that. And they, uh, I found out that they call themselves the Branch Davidians. So the original movement was just called the Davidians back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And it was very apocalyptic from the start. And it was led by a gentleman by the name of Victor Hotoff, H-O-U-T-E-F-F, -F, who died uh, I forgot exactly the year, but in the 50s. But that group expected the end to come. Their big uh, uh, prediction was 1959. Hotoff had already died, but his wife Florence uh, took over leadership of the group. And what distinguished the Branch Davidians from the Adventists is they were very interested in more literal interpretation of prophecy. So if you're reading in the book of Daniel, let's say that a certain king is going to march in the Middle East or something like that, they literally would believe that you could turn on the television when that's happening and you would see prophecy unfolding before your very eyes. So if you remember the book uh, that was very famous in the 70s, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, I think it sold more copies than any book other than the Bible in the decade of the 70s. And then you had books like Left Behind, Tim LaHaye. You had movies and so forth. This is all part of a kind of renewed apocalypticism that we've had in our own time, where people are opening the Bible, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, Daniel uh, 7, Daniel 9, Daniel 11. And it's almost like a a blueprint plan of how the end of the age is going to come about. And since 1967, with the reestablishment, uh, or rather 1948, the reestablishment of a state of Israel, in 1967, with the Six Day War, where the Israelis actually politically and militarily control the old city of Jerusalem, this got really ramped up with many, many groups, because they could now read a, a chapter like Zechariah 14, which probably, who knows how many of your listeners and viewers will even know that chapter, but it's about a final battle at the end of the age, right before the final judgment comes, when God sets up the kingdom, and it's all the nations surrounding Jerusalem and so forth. Uh, so, these kinds of groups like the Branch Davidians going back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, they, they differ with the Seventh-day Adventists in that the Seventh-day Adventists tend to be uh, more preterist. They do think that there's future prophecy ahead, like the second coming of Christ. But when they open the book of Revelation, they tend to think that it's happened throughout history. So they use very symbolic interpretations, mm. like the beast with seven heads could be seven successive revivals of the Roman Empire all through Western history, that kind of thing. So Charlemagne from the 800s, he would be mentioned in the book of Revelation, and they would try to, that's their tendency to interpret, and still to leave open the idea that it's going to come at the end. Hadaf didn't really go along with that. He felt that the book of Revelation, starting with the unfolding of the seven seals in chapter six, is really about the final events of the very, very last days, not that it's been fulfilled all through history. So you're actually looking for some really literal interpretations. Now, Koresh, uh, David Koresh, his name is Vernon Howell, his birth name. So David Koresh is a biblical name that he took. David for the idea of the messianic lineage of King David. Koresh in Hebrew is the word Cyrus, actually, which most people aren't aware of. And in Isaiah 45, there's a prophecy of Cyrus the Great, the Persian king, 
I'm talking about 539 BC, who allowed the Jews to go back to the land. And Koresh began to read that as not only about Cyrus the Great in the past, but also about him, the spiritual Cyrus. So that's why he took the name Koresh. But he was born in 1959. And in 1959, the Davidian group that Hadif had started had what they called their great disappointment. If you know about the Millerites from the 1840s, which led to the Seventh-day Adventists and Ellen G. White, uh, they had set dates in the 1840s, and then they, they interpreted them when they didn't come about, the second coming of Christ, uh, as spiritually fulfilled, like it had been done in heaven. So this has been a Seventh-day Adventist uh, tendency to make things happen in heaven, and then only later they'll be manifested literally on earth. And it's a way that apocalyptic groups really through the ages have been able to deal with the failure of expectations. They can say, well, it did happen. And so what the Adventists said in the 1840s, let me just get a drink here, was that Christ did come, not visibly into the world, but he left the heavenly sanctuary <clears throat> and he finished his, what they call investigative judgment, and was preparing to come to the earth visibly. <clears throat> so they still would stick with that date. And the Davidians broke off from that, and they set the date 1850, I mean 1959, and they actually gathered in Waco, Texas, uh, at this, uh, it's not the property that uh, the 93 group was on, but it's nearby. They called it the Mount Carmel Center, same name. It's, it's, it's just another ranch nearby outside of Waco. And they actually gathered from all over the world and they were waiting. Uh, and that day they predicted, uh, I think it was uh, during the Passover week, it was supposed to happen. And you, you know that Seventh-day Adventists keep the Sabbath, and, and this particular group also keeps some of the Jewish festivals, like, you know, Passover and so forth, as did the, the Koresh group. So David wasn't even born when that happened, but it, it, was, it was a big deflation for the movement, because what happened in 1959? Nothing. History went on. No crisis, no nothing really. And they expected that the final events would begin to unfold. So Koresh, uh, the boy, Vernon Howell, let's call him Vernon, he grew up as a kid in the Adventist church. But he heard about these Davidians down in Waco, and he went down to uh, visit them. And eventually, to make a long story short, he became their leader. He became their new prophet. So by the 1990s, he was assuming the role of the new leader of the Branch Davidian group. They had a succession of leaders all the way back to the 30s when Hadoff started the movement. I didn't know any of that on that Sunday. This is all things that I learned later. But I did call my friend Arnold, Dr. Arnold, and we began doing some research quickly and we realized when David put out a radio broadcast on March 2nd, so the siege was on February 28th, and a number of Branch Davidians were killed, a number of uh, BATF agents were killed, in the, and there was a standoff then for the next 51 days. And David said that he would come out and surrender with all of his people if the FBI, which took over the second day, by the way, the FBI came in because federal agents had been killed and the ATF that had planned the initial raid uh, was moved off the scene. I think some of them stayed around, but they weren't in charge of what was going on for 51 days. And uh, the FBI said, OK, we're going to give you a one hour radio slot on a Dallas radio station, and you're allowed to preach your message to the world for an hour. And he did. So I was able to, Philip Arnold and I were able to get a transcript of that message within a day. 
I remember he FedExed it to me overnight. We both read it. We didn't have the recording yet. And it was interesting. Uh, the transcript misinterpreted a lot of the material, didn't understand the Bible enough to know what David was really saying. For example, my, my, the one I always give is, uh, uh, let's see, there was a phrase where he used the term, the lion of the tribe of Judah, which to any biblical person, the lion of the tribe of Judah is the royal lion of David, which is the messianic lineage. And they had trans, transcribed the broadcast as the lyre of the tribe of Judas, which, what would that mean? So there are a whole lot of parts to it like that, that I could immediately say, no, I see what the guy's saying. He's not saying the liar of the tribe of Judas. He's saying the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then he was talking about the seven seals. And some of the FBI agents thought he meant like animals, you know, because Revelation does have animals in it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the beast is like this, uh, like a lion, like a bear, like a leopard. And they go, well, where is this thing about the seals, S-E-A-L-S, -E like, you know, the animals like this, you know, <laughs> dolphins or something. And, uh, of course, Philip and I realized, are you kidding? It's like I book a seal with wax seals. And, uh, you know, they, and I'm not making fun of the FBI. I mean, they're not equipped to interpret the Bible in the light of a messianic leader like David Koresh. So we got hold of that transcript and... I said to Philip, you know, he's in Texas. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I am right now talking to you. Uh, I said, you need to go up to Waco and contact the FBI and let them know that they're calling this Bible nonsense and Bible babble and saying that his message makes no sense at all. But if you're going to deal with a group, you have to understand what is their internal worldview. You know, what... Why are they there? What interpretations of the Bible do they find convincing? And then you can approach them within their own belief system. That's just to me negotiation 101. You know, understand the belief system of the people that you're dealing with. So that was pretty obvious. And Philip began to approach the FBI. And frankly, uh, the way we finally got through to Koresh was not directly through the FBI, but uh, the FBI was hearing from all kinds of people who wanted to help and wanted to interpret things and so forth. And it was just building and building president. Uh, Bill Clinton was uh, the president then, and Janet Reno was the brand new attorney general. And uh, there was this sense of, uh, on the news every night, I remember they would say, uh, nightly news, you know, it was a big thing back in those days, like 6.30 was the nightly news slot on the three main networks. And they would say, it's day 21 of the siege in Waco. And then they give like a short update. It was getting cover of Time Magazine, Newsweek, US no News and World Report. Everybody's talking about the Branch Davidians. It's hard to believe some of your older viewers will remember this very well. You couldn't escape it. It was like for 51 days, the biggest news event in the United States. It's what everybody was talking about. Well, what's happening in Waco? What's the, what's the group going to do? It was, it was amazing. So Philip had approached a few agents. So I think he was basically rebuffed by them. He didn't really, he never got to go in and just sit down with them and say, let me open the Bible and explain to you where I think these people are coming from. He never got to do that. And so Philip and I got this idea in March. Uh, I mean, in April. So this would be like 30 days into the siege. And David Koresh is letting out some of the children and he's releasing some of the elderly people. Uh, anyone who wanted to come out could come, but the group is very loyal to him. And they believe that he is not the Messiah, but a Messiah. I'll explain that as we go on. I'm just giving the overall narrative now, and we can go back and get into these concepts. Sure. So we decided uh, April 1st, April Fool's Day, no connection. Uh, we went on a radio station, a local radio station in the Waco area 
that we knew the Davidians were listening to because Ron Engelman, the host of that show every day, was quite sympathetic to the Davidians and was blaming the government for the way they had handled the whole thing from the start. And we can talk about that too, that initial raid. Why did the BATF come up with cattle car trucks full of SWAT team looking guys with automatic weapons, you know, unloading and who fired first and Very why was it a shootout and so forth. So anyway, we got on that station. We did, it was just like a half hour program. And it was basically uh, Phil and I talking. Ron Engelman said, you guys just go. I know David and his followers are listening. What would you say to David Koresh if you could talk to him right now? So we had planned it out. We had talked to uh, Livingston Fagan, one of the main Branch Davidian leaders that had been sent out by David as a kind of a spokesperson. He was in jail, but we spent many hours talking to him during that month of March. So we really were beginning to understand what their views were, what their religious beliefs were, why they were there. We knew quite a bit about it. And so what we did in our broadcast was to suggest to David that uh, he should come out. And our basic argument was, look, nobody knows your message. On March 2nd, you gave this one hour radio broadcast. You thought it went out to the entire country. It was only on a local station, almost nobody heard it. And the transcript of it had all of these mis, you know, trans, uh, what would you say, transcriptions of what you had actually said. So nobody has any idea what you're all about. And you claim you have a message for the world. And we didn't speak to him directly. We were talking to each other. But I would say, you know, Philip, David claims he wants to reach the world with the message. And he, he's the only one that can interpret the book of Revelation. But nobody has any idea what his interpretation is. And we said things like, you know, the apostle Paul went to jail and wrote some of his major letters from jail and explained his message. I wonder if Koresh has ever thought that instead of this ending in tragedy, he should make a deal with the FBI, come out, and he's got the attention of the entire world now. Before this happened, only a few hundred people on the planet had ever heard of David Koresh. There were only a, about 100 people at the Mount Carmel Center when the siege took place. So basically, it was appeal to his own self-interest. If you have a message, what is it? I mean, we're sympathetic. We're biblical scholars. We're willing to hear it. And we would even take it to people like Billy Graham, Pat Robertson, you know, major evangelical leaders. We would act as your liaison if you really have something to say that you think is just so amazing and is just going to rock everybody back on their heels in terms of your interpretation. Because that's what he was claiming. He was claiming to finally have the secrets of the book of Revelation, which, as you know, people have puzzled over for 2,000 years and almost gone crazy over in terms of trying to interpret. So there's a sense in which we were pulling him along into that. But uh, we didn't know if he heard it or not. We figured he might have heard it, but we didn't know if he personally heard it. But uh, it did go over the air. And uh, then uh, basically David told the FBI, this was getting into the first week of April, we're going to shut down and not talk to you anymore until after Passover. It says, we keep the feast of Passover. And it you can look it up. It was like April 3rd, 4th, 5th, right in there, right after our broadcast. And the FBI thought Passover was like one day. You know, they probably checked with some Jewish people and said, well, when's Passover? And we, oh, well, it's, you know, next Wednesday or whatever. And then for the next seven days, he wouldn't, he wouldn't respond to them. So they said, he said he was going to talk to us after Passover. And he was going to come out after Passover and make a deal. 
And now it's after Passover and we've heard nothing from him. So clearly it's another case of him lying and trying to, you know, string us along and so forth. Well, we were able to inform them that Passover lasts eight days. Eight days. Uh, because you also have the days of unleavened bread. You know, people that know the Bible know Passover is the first night of unleavened bread. And then the festival lasts for eight days. So guess what? Uh, we were able to get our tape of the broadcast into the uh, Mount Carmel Center on a cassette recording through the lawyer Dick DeGuerin, who had been going and visiting the Branch Davidians, trying to make a deal with them. And uh, I can tell you later the story of how we met him, but it, there it was being covered in the news every day. Dick DeGuerin, he's a Houston lawyer. He's gone in, he's meeting with them, he's trying to work out a deal. And so, lo and behold, the day after Passover, it was Wednesday, April 14th, David sent out a letter. I got a copy of the letter right here. And I'll, I'll, it's very short. I'll read you the letter. Sure. That he sent out. Um, he sent out a number of letters, and I've, I've just got them stapled together here. But here's the letter he sent out the day after Passover. And we only found out later what had happened. And what had happened, I'll tell you now where it makes sense, is uh, Dick DeGuerin went in with our tape because people who had heard the broadcast inside had told David, who had not personally heard it, he was busy with some things. And he had been wounded, by the way. So also, he wasn't in the best physical shape. He'd been shot in, in the initial raid. Mm. And so uh, the, a lot of people inside, like my friend David Tibita, who survived the fire on the 19th, April 19th, he said, oh, yeah, people heard it. They were all excited that finally there were two biblical scholars that seemed to want to, like, understand us, maybe, and we could actually have some sort of an understanding or dialogue in terms of what we're saying, what, what the FBI is saying. So DeGuerin went in there with the FBI permission. He took the tape because they had asked. They said, we want to talk to Tabor and Arnold. They go, well, we're not going to send them in. It's too dangerous. But we will send in the tape since you didn't hear it. And DeGuerin sat at the table in the dining room. They all gathered around. David is sitting right there in front of a cassette recorder. And he played the tape for David. And then that was right before Passover. And David said, well, I'll give you my answer after Passover. As I said, it was eight days later on the 14th. And here's what he says. I'm presently, he says, dear Dick, he wrote it to Dick DeGuerin, the lawyer, April 14th, 1993. Dear Dick, I'm presently being permitted to document in structured form the decoded message of the seven seals. Upon completion of this task, I will be free of my waiting period, he puts in quotes, because he says that God had told him to wait. This was all the way back uh, on March 2nd when that broadcast had gone out. He said, uh, I did say I would come out, but I've now been told to wait. And everybody, oh, he's delaying. You know, it's just a stall tactic and so forth. I hope to finish this as soon as possible, and I will stand before man to answer any and all questions regarding my actions. This written revelation of the seven seals will not be sold. It's to be available to all who wish to know the truth. And we had suggested that. Why don't you write your message in a short manuscript? You know, seven seals, what? four or five pages per seal and release it and everyone in the world can read what your message is and you claim you've been sent to the world with a message so we sort of use that appeal to him and apparently he went for it he says the four angels of revelation seven are ready to punish foolish humankind mankind but the writing of these seals will give everybody a chance so basically, here's a preacher who finally believes he gets to take his message to the whole world with modern media. It would have been 
It would have worked. I've been praying so long for this opportunity to put the seals in written form. I was shown that as soon as I'm given over to the hands of men, you know, surrender, get arrested, go to jail, I will be made a spectacle of, and people will not be concerned about the truth of God, but just the bizarrity of me in the flesh as a person. And that's part of what we had said. You know, everybody says, you take other men's wives, and you you believe this, you believe that, you know, you, you think you're Jesus Christ, uh, which actually he didn't think. And then he says, I, I thank the Father that he's giving me this chance to do this. So here's how it concludes. I won't read the whole thing. He says, I will demand that the first manuscript of the seals be given to you. That's the lawyer, Dick. Many scholars and religious leaders will wish to have copies. I will keep a copy with me. As soon as I see that people like Jim Tabor and Phil Arnold have a copy, I will come out and you can do your thing with this beast. So that's his language. Mm. You know, like chain me, tie me up, put me in jail, but my message will be out. So we were so excited about that. That was Wednesday, April 14th. We thought, wow, sometimes things work. Uh, he's gonna write his message. He will deliver it to the lawyer. They also had some legal things that they signed that were, you know, arrangements between his lawyer and uh, him and his people. Like he insisted that Texas Rangers take custody of the people coming out, not the FBI. And they agreed to that because this is like local people that maybe understand the culture in Texas. So to make a long story short, uh, we, we were very hopeful. Uh, we assumed he was writing away on his message. And he did announce on Saturday, I've, I've got a tape of, we have all the tapes of the negotiations with the FBI agents. That, and uh, these, these have all been released, transcripts. They're all online, by the way. I'll give you the links if people want to look this up. And I remember Saturday night, uh, David uh, is talking to one of the negotiators, and it's he's so friendly. I, I would call it the last words of David Koresh. And he goes, how's that man? Uh, the negotiator, I'm not going to use his name, but he said, David, how's that manuscript coming? And he said, it's coming along fine. I finished the first seal. And he said, well, how long do you think it'll take you to get all seven? And he goes, well, I'm just going to keep working. I'm dictating it. I've got he has a stenographer that was typing it up for him. Her name was Ruth Riddle. She, she survived the fire, by the way. That's why we have the manuscript, because she uh, put it on a disc and brought it out with her. But anyway, it's a real friendly conversation. Like, they're joking about the negotiator says, David said, you know what I'm looking forward to? A hot shower and a pizza with everything on it. You know, they're talking like this. And the, the FBI guy goes, well, I'll buy you know, kind of like huh. they're being friends, you know, like you guys are coming out. We got this solved. You're writing your message. And he says, but David, you need to get back to work. You need to work on that and get it out because, you know, the bosses, this is in D.C., the FBI guys there, a lot of them think you're not really working on it. And just like that March 2nd radio broadcast, this is just a, another stalling technique. And. There's talk about you guys being a suicide group and, you know, maybe you're going to say you're coming out and then try to blow everybody up or try some sort of a trick or something like that. And so anyway, uh, it ended very, very friendly. And that's the last thing we heard from David. I remember the last words of David were, uh, he says, well, I'm going to get back to work. And, and the negotiator said, well, I can't wait to read it. Whether he meant that or not, I don't know, but, you know, he, he's working with a, a preacher. Can't wait to read your message. And David said, it's going to knock your socks off. Those are his last words. It's going to knock your socks off when you see it. So anyway, Sunday morning, uh, the uh, was basically the last day of the siege. And the tanks and the... Uh, uh, 
began to come in. Uh, there was meeting over the weekend in D.C. and on April the 19th, that became the fateful day. They began a different plan. Forget the manuscript. He's probably bluffing. This was the, not the negotiators. I think the negotiators believe maybe they should keep working with this possibility. But the tactical people had gone to Janet Reno over the weekend and she had said to them, is there any argument for waiting? Do you get any indication that he might come out? And you know what we've documented? They did not tell Janet Reno about this surrender letter that I just read you about his plan wow. that he claimed he was writing. They did not tell her that. And she even reversed herself over the weekend and said, you know, I don't know if this gas, CS gas is such a good idea because there's women and children in there. And that gas is very, very dangerous. People can die from this gas if they get too much. And they said, I'm not sure we should do that. And they kept pressuring her. We've got real good records. You know, there were, there were uh, congressional hearings on this. I testified before Congress. You can get that online on C-SPAN now. And there were just really good, uh, good information uh, that's out there later as to what happened. So we know exactly what happened in D.C. And, you know, I never blamed Janet Reno, even though she reversed herself and she said, OK, Monday, go ahead with the, go ahead with the plan. They said, yeah, it's going to flush everybody out. They'll be coughing. They won't be able to breathe. You know, we're going to make them all come out of the place and we'll just arrest them. And I was able to talk to her years later. She came to give a speech at UNC Charlotte, not about Waco. But uh, the people that I had worked with in Charlotte uh, told her, said, well, Professor Tabor's here at Charlotte. You know, would you want to meet with him after your talk? So I was able to have a private meeting with her. And this was years later. And she said, Dr. Tabor, I had no idea what you guys were working on. And if I had known, I obviously would have not approved that gas attack. I didn't know you had worked out this thing with the lawyers. They didn't tell me all this. So I've never blamed Janet Reno. I think she, this really weighed on her, you know, with these uh, many, many people being killed in the fire at the end and so forth. So what happened was a fire broke out that afternoon by noon or so. Many of us watched it on television live. It was horrible. We watched that place just go up in smoke. You can easily find the videos just Googling Waco uh, tragedy or whatever. They're hard to watch. There's a lot of discussion as to who started the fire, how the fire started. That's a separate thing that we could talk about, but what I want to emphasize is this right here. This is the manuscript by David Koresh of the first seal. I did provide with it an interpretation, but the seal itself is 13 pages with the part that he wrote. And about half of it is putting in the scriptures that I put in because he didn't even put in, like you can see here, he has a long quotation at the top from the book of Revelation. So actually the part that he wrote is probably only about six pages. So if you figure he's got seven, he's, he wrote this during the week of Passover and he's got six more seals to explain. It would have probably been a manuscript of about 30 pages or so. And with the scriptures, maybe a little more. So this is what we have. Uh, Ruth Riddle, who survived the fire, she came out and she grabbed the disc, the computer disc, and stuck it in her pocket as she exited and got out a window and was able to survive the fire. There were nine people that literally just, you know, what do you do in a burning building if it's getting right on you? You find a window and exit a door or whatever. So nine people made it out. Most of the people died in the fire. 86 people total died in the fire. And this is men, women, and children. And it was just totally tragic. 
but the disc did survive and Dick DeGaran got the disc and he sent it to me uh, by express mail. It wasn't like I could just pop it in a computer back in those days. It was done on a, what's called a word processor. Like we didn't have word and all these computer programs like we have now kind of. So when I stuck it in my computer, I was using a PC as I recall. It just looked like gibberish. It looked like machine language and then it would have some things in English and then machine language. And, and I thought, man, because I'm reading the coded message of that word processor. And I didn't know the brand of the word processor, but they used to have these things in the nineties that they're not computers. They're not like personal computers like we got later. They were literally just uh, like a uh, glorified typewriter. It's you're typing on it and it's recording your document and then you can print it out. Uh, so we didn't know what kind he was using or what the software was. But I was able pretty, it took me probably about three days to go through that disc and I would call it up on a screen. And because I knew the book of Revelation really well and knew a lot about his interpretation that I'd learned from Livingston Fagan, the guy in jail. I was able to piece it together pretty easily. It was like a jigsaw puzzle. Like, you know, people could say today, well, how do you know you assembled it correctly? It's like when you're finished the jigsaw puzzle, not one piece is out of place and you know it. How do you know it? Because you can see the whole thing and there it is. And if one piece is wrong, it doesn't look right. That's how this was. I literally took phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, and was able to recreate it. And you can get this, I'll give you the, uh, the link to get this, anybody that wants to print it. And I also, with Dr. Arnold, wrote a commentary because I felt like people are not gonna understand a lot of this stuff. The FBI called it Bible gibberish and so forth. <laughs> and uh, so unfortunately, uh, everybody died. The nine people that survived the fire got out and the people that David had let out before the fire got out. I've interviewed many, many of them over the ensuing, it's been almost 30 years. I've interviewed particularly David Thibodeau, who was one of the survivors. He probably was the one who survived, who knew maybe the most about the biblical message. I've spent many hours talking with David Thibodeau. And uh, you can find him on a lot of internet interviews as well that are out on YouTube. So I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of what they believed. And I can tell you this, the whole thing was totally unnecessary from start to finish. First of all, they should have never done the raid on the 28th. Ostensibly, it was because the group was hoarding weapons. And the charge was that they had converted some semi-automatic weapons, which are perfectly legal in Texas, to fully automatic, which is actually legal as well if you use a certain kit that converts the weapon and fill out a single page form that is like your license registering it with the BATF and saying that you did it. So it's not like you can't do it but you have to turn in the paperwork, which apparently the Vidians didn't do. I don't, I think there were only like a dozen of those weapons, but if you consider the community as a whole, it was uh, 130 people total, uh, pretty well divided into thirds, like, you know, 40 or 50 men, 40 or 50 women and the rest children. Uh, the amount of arms that they had, uh, somebody made the point that it was uh, less than the average Texan owns three to four weapons or something like that, that if you, you know, put everybody together, it, it wasn't like some sort of arsenal that they're going to take over the world with. <laughs> but the reason they had these weapons is they made a living by going to gun shows. That was their main source of income. And all over Texas, you have these gun shows. And they would uh, buy, they were bartering, buying and selling guns and, uh, you know, completely legal as far as I know at these gun shows. They were, 
but they were able to make a profit. They were doing various kinds of things in terms of uh, trading guns and so forth. The guns were really a, a small part of it, but even if they had wanted to arrest David Koresh uh, and the group to question them on the guns, I relate two incidents in my book. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're going to mention, but we'll put it up. Why Waco, where I tell everything in great detail, co-written with uh, Eugene Gallagher, another scholar, and I. And two other things we relate is that before the raid on February 28th, when they came in with those cattle cars full blast, uh, they called, they went to visit David's gun dealer in Waco. His name's Henry McMahon. I think he might still be living, but I think he might have passed away. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, they wanted to ask the gun dealer that David was using to purchase legally weapons. Uh, what has David got out there? How many guns has he bought and so forth? And Henry McMahon said, uh, excuse me, let me go to the back for a second <laughs> and get you those records. And he called David on the phone and he called, you know, they're friends. I mean, this is a small town uh, type environment. He also knew the sheriff very, very well. The local sheriff used to come out and sit on the front porch with David and drink iced tea. You know, he'd been out there many, many times. This is like a friendly thing, not like a, let's attack these people because they're so dangerous, they're going to shoot us. So Henry gets David on the phone and he says, David, there's some federal agents asking about your guns and what you have. He goes, really, really? Why, why are they asking? He says, I don't know. What should I tell him? He says, tell him to come on out. Tell him to come on out right now. Uh, I'll show him our gun room. They can look at anything they want. We have nothing to hide. Everything's legal. So he goes back in. This is his testimony, Henry McNinn. And the BT, he, he says, I got him on the phone. He wants to talk to you. He says, come out. He'll see you right now. And they go, no, no, shh, no. <laughs> you weren't supposed to call him. So David was already tipped off that something was going on from that call. Also, you probably read this. David used to jog every morning. He would leave the, they, the FBI called it the compound, like it's some military thing. <laughs> it's the Mount Carmel Spiritual Bible Study Center. That was their name for it. The Mount Carmel Spiritual Bible Study Center. Anybody could go and study the Bible with David. He welcomed people to come. Uh, David Thibodeau, the guy I mentioned that survived, he was David's drummer because uh, David was a musician, a rock musician also. You know how he met Thibodeau? He met him in a guitar shop one day when they were, you know, David was looking at uh, drums and Corey, I mean, David Thibodeau and Corish was looking at guitars and they started talking and he says, do you know anything about the Bible? And Thibodeau's like, no, not really. He says, you got to come out sometime. We can play, you know, I'll, you can play drums for us and we'll do some things and then we'll study the Bible together. Well, David got converted to the religion, you know, by going out there. So I'm just saying that to say that Koresh was completely open. He, he wanted people to come. He would have wanted the BTF, BATF to come and he would have joked with them and said, okay, guys, you can see my guns, but you got to bring your Bibles because I also want to teach you about the seven seals in the book of Revelation. This is just the way he was. So anyway, uh, he, he jogged every morning. So he would leave the uh, Mount Carmel Center and go down the road. And he was on the main highway that went in front of the ranch. And he would jog about three to five miles every morning. He would go up and come back and make a kind of a circuit. Anybody could have picked him up anytime. Just drive up in your squad car and say, uh, are you David Koresh? Uh, we have a warrant for your arrest, or at least we, we have a warrant to question you about the weapons you have. I'm totally sure David would have said, would you want to come and see them right now? Or do you want me to come in and talk to you? I mean, David didn't want any trouble with the law, but he was a Texan. And you're going to hear, if you listen to some of the negotiation tapes, he gets very upset. He says, you come to my house. It was very you know, kind of self-defense idea. And you come up with, in cattle cars, with people armed with, you know, combat gear, and you shoot the dogs out front. 
they had a pen of little puppies and the, that the kids had their pet dogs and the question of who fired first. And David said he went to the front door when he saw them pull up and he says, hey, you guys, wait, wait, don't shoot. There's women and children here. Let's talk. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody fired and it's disputed who fired. In the tape that you heard that I have on my YouTube channel, uh, James Tabor, the, the YouTube channel that I run, uh, and I know you listened to that. It's a three-hour discussion of all this. Well, a group of scholars on that Yeah, a group table. of scholars. Uh, yeah. We talk about all that in great detail. You know, when did the fire start and who shot first and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, Dick DeGuerin, who went in and out several times, you know, the lawyer, he, he's a Texan. He, he, he hunts. He knows firearms. And he said, uh, I can tell you this, James. The bullets I saw through the metal door in front were incoming. They, you know, in other words, this is BATF bullets going in. And that's what hit David. David was right in front of the door when he was shot. And David's father-in-law, Perry Jones, was shot in the abdomen and died. And he was also standing right in front of the door. But this is a wooden building, almost like plywood. And imagine if you've seen these videos of the ATF hiding, the, they're kind of crouched down behind the cars and they're just like bam, 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 bam into a, a wooden building with women and children inside. Now, the, some of the Davidians did shoot back for sure. No question about it. So I'm not defending that. I'm not defend, you know, I'm not defending either side or blaming either side. I'm just saying it was it was handled abysmally. And then the 51 days, the problem with the siege, as we tried to tell the FBI, is you're delivering to them the very apocalypse that they're expecting. Like they expect that someday they're going to get attacked by the forces of Babylon, which they consider, you know, the government forces to be the enemy. And by the way you're behaving, you're convincing them that you are the enemy. And now David with the negotiators was extremely friendly. And one of the main negotiators that he worked with, they actually took him off about halfway into the siege because they felt like he was being too accommodating to David. And uh, I've talked some to him as well. And we've all been involved together in discussions since. And uh, I think he was pursuing a really good uh, uh, opening to have some understanding with Koresh and what his beliefs were. So basically, that's the long version of what happened at Waco. And uh, that's taken us about an hour to go through that. We could also spend maybe a little time. I, I've got another half hour or so. I know you don't like to do shows too long, but we can go for a while and maybe talk about what their message was. You know, like I've given you all, you know, the siege and how it happened and how it, but to go in with tanks at the end and tear gas. I mean, look at it from the Davidian point of view. They just figured apocalypse now, this is it. You know, we're, it's all over. What we told them was back off, put a perimeter around the place, and just make it boring. Make it boring. Instead, they cut off the electricity. The people didn't have uh, proper food, uh, milk for the kids. They would trade off like, well, you send us a kid and we'll give you some milk. It was all adversarial rather than trying to come to some understanding. And, you know, I have listened to 51 days of negotiating tapes. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. And I'm telling you, this is in my mind. You know, I don't remember everything, of course. But largely, Koresh was trying to be accommodating. And the negotiators were excellent. They did a wonderful job. And I feel like where things went, went wrong was that last weekend, where the tactical people said, this has gone too long. We just need to go in and get it over with. 
And that was a, a tragedy. And I think many of the FBI, uh, with all the hearings and congressional investigations, uh, there, there is an admission now that, that maybe it could have been handled differently. Now, are you familiar, Jacob, with the Paramount television series that was on Netflix? I think it's moved from Netflix, but you can get it on Amazon. It's just it called is, Waco. Is that, is that the Six series? Is, 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 there, is there a reenactment? Yeah, it's a scripted series. And Taylor Keish plays Koresh. And I'm telling you, he nails that part like, like you would not believe. Thibodeau told me when he watched it, and remember, he, he knows David. He said, I got this feeling, I couldn't even believe that Taylor was able to so absorb the part that it was like I was actually going back in time and hearing David Corey speak. I would really Amazing. recommend that it's six part series that, you know, like just like a series on television, scripted streaming series. You can buy, you can buy it, but I know it's on Amazon. Or you can go to the Paramount Pictures website and get it. It, it was on Netflix for over a year and it was in the top 10 for a long time. It is chilling to watch. And uh, it does tell the story. I have a part in it, not me personally, but some actor portrays me toward the end. It's not very accurate, but at least I, you know, they kind of say that these biblical scholars were working, trying to work things out. Right. And uh, Dick DeGaran has, you know, he has a character in it. It's a pretty uh, accurate uh, rendition. They used one of the FBI agents and they used Thibodeau as their two consultants one kind of inside the group and one outside. And I think they really tried to be accurate, uh, the two directors, the Doddle brothers. So I would recommend that. You know, sometimes visuals like that are easy to absor easier to absorb for people than listening to somebody like me talk for two hours. So it, it's really well done and it's largely accurate. One, th one of the things... Here's some of your questions about the group and their beliefs or anything that you've wondered about? Well, actually, I, I have new questions based on the things that you've, uh, you've said so far. Um, okay. Why, why wasn't Janet properly informed? Why wasn't she told about the, the work that the scholars were doing with uh, David Koresh? Why, why, was she, why was that left out? Why do you think that was left out? Well, the FBI agents that I've talked to, and I have talked to several of the top ones, they are saying that they're still not convinced that he was really working on the seals, his manuscript. And they would say that this is just some computer disk <laughs> that he probably had from some of his old Bible study stuff that is absolutely disproven. Now, remember, they hadn't seen it at the time, so they could have believed that. I'm not saying they didn't believe it. But they just said, we don't have any proof. Now, the day of the uh, gas attack with the tanks, Steve Schneider, who's David's main right-hand man, got on the phone with the FBI, and he said, We've got the first seal done. David finished it last night. Let us send it out to you. And that was just ignored. And Koresh got very angry. And I believe Snyder threw the phone out the door, ripped the cords and just threw it out because he said, hey, they're determined just to do this. I don't think Reno was, well, I know she wasn't informed of it because she told me she wasn't informed of it. But I think it had to do with a lot of the higher ups becoming convinced that he was just a two bit uh, con man, manipulator, uh, typical cult leader. And anything he said was unreliable and he was just stalling. And 51 days was enough. And I think there was pressure to let's just end it. And of course, I do not believe, I know some people are so rabid against the government, they think, oh yeah, the government wanted to kill those people. I've never believed that. 
Absolutely, I don't believe that. I think there was a grief over the deaths of those children and the people cleaning up afterwards. It was a horrible scene. And the children were trapped in a lower area where they thought they could put them to get away from the gas. And that ended up just becoming like an oven. And you don't even want to think about all that went on in that building. It just went up like tinder. It was horrible. And, uh, but I, I think they became convinced that Chorus was, like I said, just, uh, they talked about, he's just spouting ba Bible babble. Uh, they did report a lot of information that was incorrect. Like one of the main things they said is he claims he's Christ. And they said that a uh, complete misunderstanding of what David uh, believed about himself. David was a Christian. David believed that Jesus Christ was Christ. He didn't think he was Christ. Did you know that this group took the Lord's Supper daily? You know how some churches take it weekly, monthly? They took the bread and the wine and had a ceremony remembering Jesus Christ and his last night every day. So to say that they weren't devoted to Jesus is horrible. The whole manuscript is about the revelation of Jesus Christ in the seven seals. What David claimed to be was what he called a, well, he said a sinful Messiah, not a perfect Messiah like Jesus, but a final Messiah of the last days mentioned in the book of Revelation, who is going to unlock the seven seals and preach the final message. So his claim was that he had been given the interpretation of these seven seals. Now, if you read the seven seals in chapter six, if you remember, it's like a white horse, a red horse, a pale horse, a black horse, hmm. and then there's this, and then there's that. And most people would say, well, that means war, that means famine, that means this, that means that. Well, what David shows as a sample, because you got the first seal here, is he believed that each of those seals was actually a coded message that would take you back through all the prophets of the Hebrew Bible. So it's full of quotations from Hosea, Amos, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Joel, and he ties it all together. So if you said to him, uh, well, what do you mean a sinful Messiah? He would have you turn to the Psalms where you do have a Messiah spoken of, who's, and he's called the Messiah, and he says, my sins are more than the hairs of my head. The guy writing the Psalm. And David would say, that, is that Jesus? Jesus is saying my sins are more than the hairs of my head. Christians don't believe Jesus was a sinner. So he said, who is this talking about? And it's a Psalm 45. You can look it up. It's about the, the king. And I think I've got my Bible here if we want to read any of it. But So he claimed to be not the Messiah, but a Messiah. Remember, Messiah means anointed one, chosen one. But he did claim to be the last prophet that was going to come and finally reveal and the people who followed him had become convinced. Now, I should make clear, look, I'm not a branch Davidian. I don't believe David was a Messiah or the Messiah. But what I wanted to do is to interpret the message of David as clearly as possible so we could understand why these people were sticking with him. And if you ask them, they would say, because he showed us in the Bible the things that are revealed in the book of Revelation in, in a way that nobody has ever taught before. That was basically what he claimed. So they actually, did you know they didn't even call themselves branch Davidians? They call themselves Bible students. Like if you said, well, what are you? Are you part of Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ, Catholic? What are you? Pentecostal? They'd say, we're students of the seven seals. What is that? We are a group of people with our Bibles, 
many of us from the Adventist church at one time, and we're studying the seven seals. That's what they would claim. So essentially, uh, we just felt it was really important to get that out. And uh, unfortunately, that was never conveyed to uh, General Reno, Attorney General Reno, or to President Clinton. You know, President Clinton, the day of the fire, had a press conference in the Rose Garden. I'm sure it's on, on the, online if you look it up. Um, April 19th, 1993. And it was after the fire was out. And he did say, you know, regrettably, all these people have died and it's all over now. But one thing he said that will always stand out, and that's why I wrote this book, Cults and the Battle for the Religious Freedom in America is the subtitle. He said, let this be a warning to any in America who would be tempted to join a cult. And I, as a religious studies scholar, I couldn't believe that language. I've never gotten to talk to President Clinton. If I ever could, I would say this to him. The problem with that language is you're assuming that somebody can define what's a cult and what's not a cult. Baptists in New England in the 1700s were hung from lampposts because they were members of a cult, not the official religion of the state, right? Various groups have been tarred, feathered, murdered, and claimed to be members of a cult. And so in religious studies, one person's cult is another person's sincerely held beliefs. And we do have religious freedom in this country. And you are allowed to believe anything you want, anything, right? And we're all happy about that. And you're allowed to try to persuade anyone you want, as long as you don't use physical manipulation or any kind of criminal activity. Like you can't tie somebody up and, right. you know, starve them and make them, you know, now, some people say, well, yeah, but you shouldn't brainwash people. Brainwashing is not even a concept accepted by most psychologists because think of very convicted people with all kinds of religious beliefs, and they won't even listen to anything. And you're going to go, say somebody's a Roman Catholic, and they say, hey, the Pope's right, and the church is right, I don't care what you say, and I don't even want to listen to your arguments. You go, well, you've been brainwashed. You know, if you tie somebody up and put them in a closet or, or something like that, you know, uh, and that kind of thing, that's different. But these people, did you know that we have on tape now, and I think this is also on, on the internet now, interviews with about 20 of the Branch Davidians during the siege where they're just sitting in a chair with the videotape talking about why they're there and why they came there and why they're staying and why they're not going to leave. And uh, they're very normal people just talking about, well, he showed me this in Psalm 45 and he showed me this and I've come to, I've become convinced that he's the, what he says he is and so forth. It's not against the law to have religious beliefs. So I feel that President Clinton's statement was very problematic because it would imply that the government somehow could come up with a tally or list of acceptable and unacceptable groups because he said this should be a warning to anyone who might be tempted to join a cult. Who's going to define a cult? In other words, in America, that's the subtitle of the book, Cults and the Battle for Religious Freedom in America. One person's cult, as I said, is another person's sincerely held beliefs, right? Whether you disagree with them or think they're completely illogical, we have to have religious freedom. And any of us are allowed to believe whatever we become persuaded of, and we're allowed to try to persuade others. And, uh, you know, people get persuaded of all kinds of things. What about parents? They send their kid to school. Kid falls in love with somebody they cannot stand, and they believe the person is having undue influence on them. It's not religion, but it's personal influence. 
what are you supposed to do? Lock the person up or forbid, you know, uh, and it's, people have to be free to grow up and learn their own ways. Obviously, children are a question. And if anybody is manipulating or misusing a, ch a child or abusing a child, that's against the law. Our refuge is our laws. That's our refuge. If somebody's breaking the law, then they answer for breaking the law, right? But if somebody has a belief that you think is just crazy, like David Koris is the final messenger of God to the world, you don't kill somebody over that. Uh, so it was a big, big tragedy. Now, I will tell you this, Jacob. When the Montana Freedmen, remember, would not surrender to the FBI, guess what? Phil Arnold went up there, met with them. Other religious scholars went, and it, was, it ended it peacefully because they tried to take into consideration why the Montana Freedmen had a different view of property rights and a different view of the land that was in dispute. And uh, there was a give and take. But if you remember right before Waco was the Randy Weaver case, remember, in Idaho? And that was the same SWAT team that ended up uh, in that initial raid on February 28th, some of the same people involved in that. And even though Randy Weaver was an independent, separatist, anti-government kind of guy, the question was, did it need to end the way it did? with his wife being shot and killed as she's standing at the door holding her baby. And you can look up Randy Weaver and what happened there. And uh, there have been films done on that too. So I actually think uh, that the FBI and their negotiators for the last 30 years, they've been meeting with religious studies scholars. I think there's more, we, we've come a long way so that if there's a standoff, in the future that involves religious convictions, a religious group that somehow has broken the law or something has happened to cause a conflict. I think there's, we're in much better shape now as a country. And uh, I know a lot of anti-government people will not like me saying anything about, anything good about the government, but I don't believe the FBI, you know, wants to go out and kill people like the Branch Davidians. That's just not my belief. And the ones I've talked to, I think, are truly, truly grieved over how it ended. And uh, they're very sorry about it. And then look what happened with Timothy McVeigh getting upset about that and blowing up the FBI building in Oklahoma City two years later to the day. This is the kind of thing that needs to stop. I mean, Timothy McVeigh is as wrong as wrong could be. And look what he did in terms of killing all those innocent people that were with the FBI, including uh, uh, some of the dependents and people that just worked there. So uh, I'm hoping that we can learn a lesson from Waco and uh, as a culture, as a society. And I don't think a, the word cult is a useful term because I don't know who's going to define it. I prefer to talk about a religion that might be what I would call high demand. You can have a religion with a charismatic leader that puts very high demands on its followers. And some people would say, well, that's a cult. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth was a charismatic messianic leader who put high demands on his followers, right? Like sell everything you have and follow me. Now, Christians say, yeah, but he was Jesus. But what did the Romans think? Didn't the Romans define Christianity as an unlawful cult in the first century, right? Nero persecuted the Christians as a cult. That word is used. Cult should just mean religious group. And that's what it means. You know, if you talk to an anthropologist or a sociologist or a religious studies scholar, a cult just means a religious group. It had, later came to mean like Jim Jones, people that killed themselves, 
or you know the branch davidians waco is now used for that kind of thing and i think jim jones was i, I mean I, I think a lot of what he did was horrible but i still don't know that it needed to end the way it did you know with uh what a, up to a thousand people drinking the kool-aid as we say when they felt pressured that the government's going to come in and do something so i hope we've learned from some of these uh, bad experiences and, and in the future we will have better ways to deal with uh, conflicts if they come up and involve religious beliefs so i'll hand it back to you there was there's another thing I, I, i'm curious about um earlier you mentioned that there was a i think it was a radio host i forgot the name already um yeah. right early yeah, early right. on during this in the earlier days of the cg already came to the conclusion that the fbi was screwing up yeah ron engelman who he's the guy that allowed us on mm. like the videos started sending out messages to the fbi before we did our broadcast on april 1st we want to talk to phil arnold because phil had already been on the radio talking to ron engelman some and they just felt like we want to talk to somebody that will not just call us crazy cult members and and a scholar that would know something about you know biblical text from a scholarly viewpoint which phil did with his doctorate from rice university so he ron engelman concluded early on he's kind of he was kind of an anti-government guy i'm pretty sure ron has died now but he was an anti-government guy but mainly in a kind of texan sense hmm. of look American citizens should have freedom of house and freedom of property. And you can't drive into somebody's place and do this dynamic entry unless there's really, really strong cause, you know, that there's something in imminent danger. So Engelman from the start felt that this whole BATF rage raid that I think they called Operation Showtime was a stunt to try they probably thought at least some of the people that they would just go in they called it a dynamic entry they would arrest all these people bring out all the arms and say here's a dangerous group that could have been planning some kind of assault you know what the davidians really believe they didn't think they would ever fight against america they thought that they were all going to go to Israel. This was their belief because they take the Bible literally. And when that final battle for Jerusalem takes place in Zechariah 14, anybody with the Bible can look it up. It says all these nations are going to come against Jerusalem. The branch Davidians thought they would have already gone over to Israel and were going to join the IDF to fight the invaders that are trying to destroy Jerusalem. That's kind of how they were thinking, hmm. which to me is just completely crazy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I couldn't never believe something like that, but it shows you that they didn't think that they wanted to fight Americans. They weren't a terrorist group, you know, like, oh, let's go blow up something or we've got all these weapons. All right. They did believe that lots of government and press forces were going to misrepresent them and claim that they abused children and that they were sexually deviant and so forth uh and they were aware of that uh and a lot of that did come out in the press and in all the documentaries on waco uh, except for maybe one or two they unfortunately and there have been a dozen of them they unfortunately have reinforced this cult stereotype where Koresh is always presented as a raving maniac screaming and yelling and yet we have hours of tapes of Koresh where he's kind of boring i mean really he's just sitting there going okay you guys have another hour 
I want to look at uh, Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Now, let's give you an example of how he would talk. He would say, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit, out of the miry bog. He set my feet on a rock. Who is this talking about? Is this David? Is it King David who wrote it, supposedly? Or is it somebody in the future? And then he would keep reading. And he would uh, talk about how, if you keep reading, this is Psalm 40. Uh, it talks about how his sins are more than the hairs of his head. And how he's going to bring redemption to the world and so forth. So he would just go through these passages verse by verse like that. Like Thibodeau told me that they would have five, six, seven, eight, nine hour Bible studies, the group. And they're sitting there, hardly trying to go to the bathroom because they were so into listening to him teach. And they were convinced that he had been given the gift of God that is mentioned in the book of Revelation. I'll read it to you. In the book of Revelation, there's a final prophet mentioned. He's not named, but he's called a messenger. And it says that he has a little book in his hand. And they, of course, believe that that was going to be this little book. And it says that to him will be given to know all the mysteries of God's servants, the prophets. This is Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, this final messenger. And they became convinced. I mean, they would say, well, who is that? It wasn't Jesus. This is written long after Jesus. It's talking about a final messenger that's going to come toward the end. And he's going to have a little book in his hand. And he's going to unroll the book and reveal the final message. This is what they'd become convinced. And the last verse says to this guy who's eaten the book, he eats the book, which means he totally absorbs what God gave him. You know, it's in his body. You must prophesy to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And that's the verse we use to convince him to come out. And you see how he would really be persuaded by that because we said, David, before the siege on February 28th, I doubt if 300 people on the planet even knew who you were. Today, with this tragedy that has taken place before the fire, of course, millions of people have heard about you. It's on the news all over the world. All of the world is following your story. What's your message? Nobody knows what your message is. And you can see how persuasive that was to him. And we were believing in him. We were saying, if you think you're this guy, this says that you have to prophesy to peoples, nations, languages, and kings. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? And that's where we suggested, why don't you write, write your little scroll that you claim you have, you know, the message in your head. and." Uh, can you imagine what the press is going to do when you come out and they hand out copies, you know, like everybody's going to want to read it. Now, I bet a lot of your viewers are going to go to the Internet and you'll put in the link and they're going to go, man, I can't wait. I'm going to read this and see what it is. Well, be my guest. See what you think. I'm not a branch Davidian. I don't think David Koresh was anything. I'm an academic who studies religion. But I do believe that the people were very sincere. And I believe David was sincere. I believe that he thought he was kind of a, I would call him a Bible savant. Mm -hmm. His mother told me later, I interviewed his mother, Phil and I went to see her after the fire and a few years after everybody was gone, dead. And her name was Bonnie. And she said, um, when David was 10 years old, you could take a King James Bible, I don't, this is an RSV, but, and just open it anywhere, anywhere, just like a game, and read five verses, and he would instantly say, like, I just turned, Job 14, one through five, like that, just like that, any verse. <laughs> and we said to her, so you mean like parts of the, no, 
the whole Bible. He had the whole King James Bible memorized. So it's sort of like someone <clears throat> that has like, you've heard of people that are mathematical savants, you know? And you could say, what day of the week was it? July 3rd, 1782. And they'll go, Tuesday. And you go like, whoa, how did you do that? You go, I just see it in my head. What do you mean you see it in your head? What do you... <laughs> you know, there are people that are like this. You know, you give them a whole string of numbers to divide and that, what's the square root of this? And they go, 3.246. You check them with a, a calculator in their right. Hmm. I think Koresh, he was a, he, he was a kid that grew up <clears throat> and he had memorized the King James Bible. And in his brain, he was making all these associations. So like in Revelation 6, the first seal is the white horse. He would go, where else is a white horse mentioned in God's holy word? He talked like that. And somebody would go, I don't know where. He said, well, let's start with Psalm 45. I see a man riding a white horse. Let's go look and see who that what. Let's go see who that is. Well, that's the David Koresh guy, see? And so this is what he would do. So uh, again, I'm always hesitant, you know, when I do these interviews on Waco because people go, oh, you're a cult sympathizer and all you do is talk about how positive David was. And, you know, I do it in honor of the people. I do not believe it. I was not convinced by studying all that I've studied of what he taught, listening to him for hundreds and hundreds of hours. It's not my faith. But I want people to know that these people were not crazy. These people were not brainwashed. Any one of them could have sat with you, talked just as rationally as we're talking right now. And it's absolutely the saddest thing that it ended this way. And I just really regret it. I think about it all the time and it's been almost 30 years. What caused David Koresh to come to the conclusion that he was the final prophet? What he says is, this is just what he says, mm. uh, and a couple people I've talked to that knew him before and after this say it's true, is that he went to Israel in the 1990s, I'm sorry, 1980s, because 93 was the siege. I think it might have been 84 or 5, I don't have my notes with me. And the reason he went to Israel, he was trying to figure out how literally to take the Bible. You know, if it says something, particularly the book of Revelation, which is the final, if you read Revelation, it says, I'm, I've come to show you the final things that are going to take place before the end of the age. So he went over there and he noticed that in Revelation um, chapter, I think it's 11, a young man is told to measure Jerusalem and to see if there's room for 144,000 people to stand on Mount Zion. So he, that was his main thing he wanted to find out. So he flies to Jerusalem with his wife, Rachel. She was pregnant with uh, Cyrus, his firstborn son. He named him Cyrus. And uh, he lived in an apartment in Jerusalem. I've been to that apartment. Uh, years later, I went there and talked to the person who owns it and learned more about David when he was there. And Mount Zion is a hill just south of the old city. It's the southwest hill. It's the highest point of Jerusalem. It's higher than the Temple Mount. And I've excavated there now for 15 years, so I know it pretty well. I do archaeology on Mount Zion. And there is a big field that the Greeks own, the Greek Orthodox, up on the top of Mount Zion. And uh, nothing's there, no buildings or anything. There's a tennis court, a soccer field, and so forth. And it's pretty big. It's several acres. And he went to that field and he said, wow, when it says that there's going to be 144,000 of God's people standing on Mount Zion and Jerusalem's all full of houses and streets and buildings, like how could they possibly stand? To him, 
this is like a light went on. So this could really happen literally. And he thought he was going to have 144,000 followers. He didn't think it was going to end in the fire. He thought the message would go out. And exactly 144,000 people were going to read his message. And at the right time, they would all go to Israel and they would be standing on Mount Zion. So anyway, what he claims is, is that he had an ecstatic experience where he was taken up into heaven and was revealed all the mysteries of the seven seals supernaturally, like a revelation. And then came back down to earth. And it just blew his mind. He was just a Bible teacher before that. So I've talked to uh, several of his followers that knew him before and after this trip. And one of them in particular, I won't give names because I don't want to necessarily involve people's names here. But one of them has been there for many, many years, goes back to the 50s. He told me that Vernon Howell, as he called him, his real name, he said he was a good boy, a good Bible student, but he said, you know, he was one of the most boring teachers I've ever heard in my life, because he would talk for hours in a monotone and just take you through these endless scriptures that he had memorized, and it's kind of like he just glazed over after a while, you know, when somebody keeps mentioning scriptures, let's go to Zechariah 14 and compare that to, you know, Isaiah 6, and let's, you know, and this is how he taught. He said, when he came back from Jerusalem, it was like he was a new person. All of a sudden, it was all book of Revelation. I have the interpretation of the seven seals. I was given this. And if I can convince you that I have that interpretation. I was told later by uh, David Thibodeau, who survived the fires, come become one of my good personal friends. David said, you know why Koresh was favorable towards you, Dr. Tabor and Dr. Arnold. He wanted to come out, and even if he's in jail, to set up some kind of a debate or discussion where you and Dr. Arnold and he would almost have like a contest mm. to see who could best explain all of these scriptures. And I said, well, David would beat me at that because, I mean, that's not what I do. I can try to follow what he's saying, but I don't have some system of thought. And Thibodeau said, well, everybody just wanted to hear him, like, talk to a Bible scholar that knew Hebrew and Greek and really knew the text. And uh, he said that that was his real interest because he thought if that was televised, you know, the whole world would be listening and there'd be listening to him and then he would have his uh, converts so you might be wondering are there any branch davidians left and the answer is yes there are and they did not expect him to die uh at least not in waco 93 but uh they still believe uh the ones that i i have in mind there's just a few left uh they still believe he is this Messiah, little M, you know, the one who's going to bring the final message. And they believe that uh, the end will come and David will be resurrected from the dead, just like Jesus was. And, and the final events will take place in Jerusalem. So the ones who have not given up on it would say in their mind, it's written in the Bible. You know, what we learn from David remains true even though it ended the way it did, because the teachings are still valid. Hmm. So that's, uh, I, don't, I don't think they're making a lot of converts. Uh, a lot of it's out on the internet. And of course you get people claiming to be David's successor, others claiming to kind of pick up his mantle. I don't think any of those have had much success, but um, there is one Livingston Fagan you could probably find him if you wanted to uh, get his teachings. He's a, he lives in England, and he's the one that I talked to in jail during the siege. Mm -hmm. He, to me, is the most informed, and he still believes in David and would be a good representative of the 
kind of the high end, like he has a master's degree in theology, he knows Greek and Hebrew and so forth. And he would be somebody that could uh, talk about the Davidians. I don't know if he'd be willing to interview with you or not. Wouldn't hurt to ask him. Sure. But yeah. uh, he would be very sensitive about casting his pearls before swine, so to speak. You know, he doesn't want to just teach a bunch of stuff that people would use against him. So I don't really know. But I do know that uh, he sends me uh, his, uh, he sends out by email, you know, like his teachings and his interpretation of things. So I sort of keep up with him. And there's a few other people out there that are trying to hold on to their faith. But it's been pretty shattered, as you could imagine. So. Well, I very much enjoyed this interview. Um, I learned a lot today. Okay. And I'm going to leave a ton of links in the description. It looks like it's a yeah. lot of material. Um, so, yeah, you to view. So I'll, send you, I'll send you mainly those letters. Oh, you know what? I got it. You have a minute? Sure. Make one final. I told you I'm going to give you a new revelation that nobody. Oh, uh, yeah. Never given this anywhere. But you know, when the FBI claims that he wasn't working on the manuscript. Right. Um, right here. And this is online. And I only noticed this recently. If you can read the top there, it says contents of computer disk. Wow. And this is typed by Ruth Riddle, and it has all the scriptures mm -hmm. that are supposed to be inserted into the manuscript. Now, I didn't have this when I inserted all the scriptures. I had to look them up and find them. Incredible. But I didn't realize this was sent out with, this is on the back of the letter I read you. It's on the back. Wow. Now, what does that prove? If it's on the back of the letter sent out on April 14th, and it's got a list of all the scriptures that are in the manuscript, then clearly the manuscript was a real thing. And the thing that finally survived on the computer disk checks out perfectly with this. And so he was working on it, and it did exist. Indeed. And this is brand new. This is brand new. And uh, I don't think I've ever said it in an interview before. I just discovered that about a month ago. I can't believe I never noticed. I happened to turn the page over and I go, what is this? And it's listing for the person who is typing. Because he said, we got to hurry. We don't have time to put in all these scriptures, you know, writing them all. We just got to get the, the thought out. And then you later will retype the final copy and put in the verses, see? And so we got evidence of that now. From April 14th, he was writing the manuscript. So. Okay, well, thanks, Jacob. And I really appreciate you giving time to this. You know, a lot of people, 30 years next year. Uh, I usually go down to Waco on the anniversary maybe you can come down and join us and do some interviews but well, we always uh, gather on april 19th so next year will be the 30th anniversary so that's so it's uh, going down next year it always happens every year but because it's the 30th okay. i think it's going to be a big deal you have a lot of okay. press there so this and so maybe you, maybe you can come down and get to meet some of these people and do some on the spot interviews with some of them. I think it would be very interesting to hear what do they think after 30 years, you know? A lot of them have died now, the older ones have died. But there are some of the children have grown up and some of them still believe. And a lot of, uh, you know, our country is very divided, as you know, politically about government. And is right. the government good or bad? And all the things that have come over the last few years with the elections and so forth. Uh, and so there's a lot of Waco sympathizers that are not so much into David and what he taught in the Bible as they're more into like just anti-government stuff. Like, right. Yeah. So you get quite a mixed group that comes, but it's always a peaceful gathering and uh, people with all points of view gather together. 
and we do read the names of all the dead, including the BATF agents that died. And we ring a bell for each one and put a slide up. And it takes a couple hours, kind of like the 9-11 thing where they read. But we say something about each person, you know, like a kid, you know, so-and-so was three years old, his mother was this and that. And uh, usually somebody that knew the kid will say something about the kid. You know, he really enjoyed playing with his fire truck or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they'll mention each adult. So it's kind of a moving thing. And of course, many of the people there are remembering those people because they knew them. And then we usually just, uh, we have some speeches. I usually speak, Dr. Arnold usually speaks. You heard Kathy Wessinger and Stuart Wright were also in that interview. Uh, so I'm gonna send you these links uh, to the manuscript and some of that. And uh, you can put those up and I hope your program can really help people uh, rethink Waco, learn some things they didn't know about it, and let's just never let anything like this happen again in, in anywhere, but especially in the United States of America. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.